So let me start by reading Mark 14, 66 through 72. We can dive right in. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, he will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Um, so when I look at this, I, uh, I actually tried to put all my thoughts into a little outline and came up with a few points. And today I want to just look at the, um, just give you a question. And I want you to think about it. Um, and at the end, uh, Lord willing, time willing, um, I'll ask you what you think. But the question is, what is the difference between Judas and Peter? Have you ever thought about that? Both of them failed royally. Both of them betrayed Jesus. Um, but one killed himself, and the other wept bitterly. What was the difference between them? Um, did they both weep? Uh, I don't remember. Did Judas weep? I know he was sorrowful. He said that yeah, he, sorrowful. he was sorrowful. And yeah, that's what I was to say. Both were sorrowful. If you look at, um, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll turn there for you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10. Um, this is an important thing to remember, is that for godly grief, for godly sorrow, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly sorrow produces death. So there is a sorrow that leads to death, and there is a sorrow that leads to repentance. And I think you have a good example when you look at Judas and Peter. Um, Peter repented, what bitterly, Judas felt sorrowful, returned the money, and um, I think some versions even say he repented, but then he went out and committed, committed suicide. And Jesus, even before he committed this great sin, said that it would be better for this man not to be born. But when Jesus predicted that Peter was going to sin, he says, I'm praying for you. Interesting. Isn't it interesting to put those two side by side? So just think about as we read through this, what is the difference between Judas and Peter? Um, why is one restored and the other not? Why did Jesus pray for one and not the other? And, and I think that's an important, only one was restored. And the question is why? So the setup is Jesus predicted Peter's failure. Um, in Mark 14, if you want to glance at it, 26 through 31, remember Jesus said, um, you will all fall away. And Peter says, well, they may fall away, but I'm not going to fall away. And Jesus then said, well, you're going to, you're, you are going to deny me. Um, and uh, Peter said he would never deny them. In fact, he would go with them to death. He would die with Jesus. Um, and then even in the garden, there was another warning that he gave him. Jesus challenged Peter to remember what he said to him three times. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. And um, he went on to say in Mark 8, 14, 38, the spirit is willing. And uh, for Peter, his spirit willing would be, I'm willing to die with you. I'm not going to deny you, right? That was his spirit. But the flesh is weak. So the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, watch and pray is another way to look at that. So he was challenging Peter even, um, uh, even there, I believe, in the garden. And of course, we know Peter didn't follow that. So that's the setup to this, this passage. So now we have the denials. There's three denials here. I'm going to walk through um, each one of these, not too much detail again, because I think these are things that we, we know pretty well. But um, I just want to call out some of the, the details. And that's why I gave you the sheet that has the different passages. Because when you read the, the four, this is one of the few things that show up in all four Gospels. Uh, the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John sometimes includes things that show in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, but John adds some additional details, and I'll explain in a second why. And uh, his is interesting to hear because he knew, uh, he knew the high priest's family. He knew Malchus, the servant. That's where you learn who Malchus is. And he knew one of the servant girls who was 
family member of Malchus and he was there in the garden and John knew them and John was the one that allowed Peter to get in because Peter was stuck outside the door and or at the gate and uh, John went to vouch for him and allowed him allowed him to come inside so some of the things that John adds is a little more detail but when you put all four of them together you get quite a picture of what of what is happening but so the first denial is at the fire with the servant girl so they were in the the house of Annas um, Annas was the was considered the patriarch of the high priest. That, that, that's what some people refer to him as. He was a high priest, and a lot of his and Caiaphas was, as I understand, his son-in-law. Um, so that means Caiaphas married his daughter. That's how he was a son-in-law. But his sons and other sons-in-law also lived in this house as well. So it's a very very wealthy house, and um, the uh, the marketplace where Jesus, uh, I think it was Tuesday. It was Tuesday where he cast all the people out in the marketplace. That marketplace was called the marketplace of Annas. That we see it in a lot of the writings around that time. It was Annas's marketplace. And so this is a very wealthy house. And in a very uh, common, um, a lot of the rich and wealthy houses, they were built in, imagine like a, you're drawing a square, right? And in the middle would be a courtyard. You've probably seen houses like this very wealthy uh, patrician houses. Yeah, like Ben-Hur. And in the center, you would have a meeting area or a little garden or a place you could eat outside or, or, or escape the, uh, the heat of the sun because at one point there's shade somewhere if you're sitting in the courtyard there. So it was a very a desired uh, thing to have. And that's where Peter was, was in the courtyard. And it tells us he was downstairs. So the trial of Jesus um, happened first Jesus came to Annas and and he couldn't make anything stick so he went over to Caiaphas probably around so he was upstairs at Annas's house and went across the way to Caiaphas house and that's where the Sanhedrin at least 20 I think I looked last week it was 23 it was a quorum and so at least 23 of them were over there and so Peter's down in the courtyard and they start a fire it's cold um, and it says that she looked at him and Mark and that word look both in Mark and, um, and in the other Gospels where it talks about it is that she stared intently. The word means to, uh, you've probably come across this when you're at a restaurant and you see somebody and you're not, you can't quite figure out who it is. And what do you do to try to figure out? You're like you're looking at the person, I don't know, it looks very familiar. Look you're, you at the right, time. right. But you're looking at them and sometimes when you're with people, you're trying to say, do you see that person over there? What do they, don't they look familiar? And, and that's, you would use a word like this, stared intently uh, to try to figure out who this person is. So this is not just a matter of, oh, hey, look. It was more of a, hmm, and kind of look in the fire. You can just imagine with the shadows and the lights, and she's, she's staring at him intently. And uh, one thing I noticed is that she didn't talk to Peter. She didn't accuse him. Both times the servant girls uh, talk, they're talking to the people around the fire. They don't talk to him. She says to those around the fire, I think he's a disciple, <laughs> right? And in the second denial, she talks to the bystanders and says, I think, I think he's, uh, he's a disciple. I think I saw him in the garden. Um, but anyway, she stares at him. She told the people around the fire. Um, then Peter responds, hearing that. Um, he says, well, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And um, if I, I think I have it here. Yeah, in Mark uh, 1468, it says that after this first denial, the rooster crowed the first time. Um, and then we find out that Peter got up and left where he was and went, uh, went down the hallway. So remember, here's the spirit is willing. So here Peter ran away and he followed Jesus to Annas' house. He's in the courtyard, putting himself in a position where his, he's, he has a very high opinion of himself that I can do this. Jesus said no, but I think I can do it. I'm confident, almost as if he's going to show Jesus. Um, he's going to show that he is faithful, that he was not going to deny him. And I think the first... The first denial probably took him by surprise, uh, which is really how Satan attacks people. He doesn't, it's not this long, drawn out kind of thing. It's usually a surprise and it happens and you go, what had just happened? Oh my word, did I just do what I thought I did? And I think the first one was a surprise to him. Then he heard the rooster crow. Remember, um, the rooster crowing twice shows up just in Mark's account here at the, at the end of the story. And remember that this story is coming from Peter's perspective or from his sermons that he gave that Mark, Mark wrote down. Uh, we, we believe it's, this is Peter's um, uh, story. Now, the interesting thing that I found is, I don't know if any of you ever heard of this before, but um, roosters 
uh, were not allowed inside of Jerusalem. Um, and the reason why is uh, several hundred years before, uh, as I understand it, before Jesus was alive, the Mishnah, uh, um, and I can give you where it's found exactly, but here's a quote from the Mishnah. No cocks or hens must be raised in Jerusalem, even by laymen, because of the voluntary offerings, the meat on which may be eaten in any part of the city, and as the habit of the named, um, of the named fowls is to peck with their beaks in the rubbish, they may peck into a dead reptile and then peck into the meat of the offerings. So in other words, they could corrupt because you're not there watching all of the roosters and the chickens and stuff like that. They may do something to make our offerings unclean. We wouldn't want unclean offerings coming into the temple. So in all other parts of Palestine, priests only must not raise them as they use leave offerings for their meals and they must be very careful about cleanliness. So in other words, the roosters and the chickens were allowed to be raised, but not inside Jerusalem because that's where all the people came and they kept their offerings. So if that was the case, I've always wondered, like, where rooster crowing? And if you ever listen to a rooster, they, when they crow, they crow, and then they crow, and then they crow, and they crow. So to, to do it twice, he would have had to not denied usually how roosters work. Now, I know that God, God could have a rooster there, and it could be a rooster. But this, and this doesn't change anything, the interpretation or intent of what Jesus said or what happened. But um, I did a little digging. This is where I said, okay, well, then if that's true, then what was it? What was he talking about? Um, we know that the night, the Roman night and Norman day were divided into three watches. So you had uh, three three-hour watches in the daytime, three three-hour watches in the nighttime. And when you were in charge of a watch as a soldier, you watched one three-hour watch. That, that was your job. And they divide the, divided it up. It basically is six o'clock, nine o'clock, and uh, is that right? Six o'clock, nine o'clock, 12 o'clock. Uh, well, six o'clock was evening, sorry. It was nine o'clock, 12 o'clock, and, uh, and uh, three o'clock. That was the nighttime. And then you would flip it for the, uh, um, I think that's how it worked. Um, anyway, I, I might have the hours off a little bit, but there were three watches, I know that for sure. And they called it, um, they, they called it the, uh, you had the evening, uh, the evening watch, the midnight watch, and when the rooster crows was what they called it. Now, that's not, that's not an official name for it. It was called like a morning, an early morning watch, but the changing of the guard was always announced by a, a reverie, or what do they call it in music? The, or the, the, the reveille. bugle, reveille? Yeah, a reveille. And uh, they had a very specific instrument that they played. Um, it was a, a tr they called it a trumpet call, but, the, but that's what we call it. They call it a, and I don't know if I can even pronounce this, in Latin it was gullicinium, literally means the rooster sing. So when the <laughs> trumpet would, so, so their, their idiom was um, the rooster crow. That's what they called the trumpet. Um, and the rooster crow would announce when the shift, I mean shift, the, when the watch would start, when the watch would end, when the switch watch would start, when the watch would end. Um, so there's a possibility. And again, this doesn't change anything, but I've always thought of a, like an actual rooster crowing, um, but it could have been the trumpet announcing the, difference, the different watches. Um, and that fits a little, in my opinion, this is totally my opinion, but to me that fits better into the story as I studied it because these denials did not all happen one right after the other. Luke tells us that between the second and third denial, there was one hour. The trial just didn't happen, you know, in a 30 minute window and it was done. Um, and when Peter gave his third denial, Jesus was being let out and Jesus looked at him. Remember it said he looked at him and he went away and wept bitterly. So it could have been that the first rooster crow was at maybe like midnight and the second rooster crow was at 3 a.m. And uh, so that means that it, what could have happened is there's a three hour window here of Peter, uh, of his denials. So even if, even if you say, well, I think it really was a rooster crowing, it probably happened within a two hour window. Uh, of Peter uh, denying. So it's just something interesting. Again, it doesn't change what Jesus said. It doesn't change. But sometimes uh, culturally we lose a little bit of the, uh, the idioms and we don't understand in the culture when Jesus said that. Um, uh, you know, they would have known what he was saying. They know how to put those things together. And in Mark uh, 1335, um, Jesus challenges them at the end of the parable. He says, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows. And he's listing the three different watches. You see the um, evening, midnight, rooster crows, and he's talking about watches, like evening watches, 
and uh, he, the third watch is called, he calls it the rooster crow. So there, there's a little bit of evidence that it may have been that, but anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. I thought it was kind of interesting. So anyway, after hearing the rooster crow the first time, um, denial two, he moves to where the, the second denial takes place. Peter moved down the corridor or, or moved away, um, maybe a hallway. Um, uh, probably moving away, he heard the rooster crow. Maybe he's saying, okay, well, I know, I, I'm surprised that this happened, I'm shocked, or, or something like that, and just moved down the hallway away from where his failure, first failure happened. Um, but another servant girl said to the bystanders that Peter was with Jesus. And um, you can see in the, in the passages here, you can pull it together, but another servant girl said, this, was, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Um, then Peter denied it for the second time. He said, in Matthew, says he denied it with an oath. Um, Mark uh, says that he denied it. That's all it says. And Luke, it says, man, I am not. Um, and in John, um, he actually, uh, well, I, I won't get into that. It's a little bit, a little bit different the way John records uh, the, the scenario. But in the, the second one, you see it's not just that he denied it. He called oaths down on himself. Um, and the way a Jew would, uh, would have an oath, they would swear by the temple, the gold in the temple, the, by heaven above. They, they would call God as witness, as God is my witness, uh, or may God strike me dead. Um, uh, if I'm telling the lie, that, that's how they would, have, they would have an oath. It would be something very serious and usually would swear by, uh, by the temple or by heaven or by heaven's throne that God sat on that kind of thing. And so Peter jumps in and says, no. Um, then the third denial, Luke twenty two fifty nine 59 says about an hour passed before the third denial. Um, and in Matthew 26, 73 says that the bystanders approached Peter and said that in essence, his accent, accent betrayed him. If you've ever talked to somebody who's from, I, I work for a company that is in Kentucky and they have a very specific accent. And then people in Texas, they have a very specific accent and you can kind of know where somebody's from or if somebody's from New York or Boston, you can tell the difference between those four different accents, right? This is very similar. Galilean had their own specific accent and they, they could tell. And um, um, if you're interested in the Bible, there's actually three or four different places where accents play a really important part. There was one where um, where David, uh, David was fighting um, or one of the tribes were fighting against the other and one person couldn't say Shibboleth, I think it was. And they said, well, say Shibboleth. And if they couldn't say it, they would kill him. They wouldn't allow him to go over. And so they killed like 10,000 people because their accent betrayed where they were from. Um, so, so here they're saying, you're, you're, you're definitely a Galilean. I can hear you speak, you know. And um, then this, this third one, Peter says, I don't know this man of whom you speak. It was, I don't know Jesus. I don't know him. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Matthew says, I do not know the man. Um, in all four instances, it says that immediately the rooster crowed after he denied the third time. Um, in fact, Luke says, while he was still speaking, <laughs> the rooster crowed. Um, Mark says, immediately the rooster crowed. Um, and Matthew says, immediately the rooster crowed. Mark says, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Matthew says, I do not know the man. Luke says, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Um, and, uh, and then John was, gave a little bit of interesting, uh, background here. He shares a little more detail. He tells us the servant girl, um, was a servant of Caiaphas, the high priest. So she was, um, the, the current high priest, she was the slave of that high priest. And that would give her quite a bit of status, uh, because he had, uh, I mean, he was very important to be appointed by Rome, uh, moving in a lot of important circles and, and then it says the servant girl was a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. So not only was she a slave of Caiaphas, she was a relative of the person whose ear cut off. And furthermore, um, she asked, listen to how she asked this and gives more information about her. It says, did I not see you in the garden with him? Um, so it sounds like she traveled with Malchus and the entourage to arrest Jesus when Judas betrayed him. It says, did I not see you in the garden with him? And if your relative was Malchus and you saw what Peter did to them, you better believe she was paying attention, right? And now it was in the dark and torches and that sort of thing, but 
still sometimes you can have a suspicion that that's the same person that cut the ear out. And, and we all know that Peter was not trying to cut off ears, right? He was trying to slice the guy's throat or cut his head off or kill him. And uh, the guy ducked and cut off his ear and, and then Jesus healed it. And so she would have been there for the whole thing. Um, and John simply says he denied it. Um, but then he also says that once the rooster crowed. So three, three denials, um, but quite a bit of when you put all this together, you get quite a, quite a picture of this. So the aftermath of this whole situation, um, Luke records that Jesus turned and, and looked at Peter. I mean, can you imagine Peter who's so proud, said that I'm not going to deny you, that I would die with you. He's the one that picked up the sword and attacked, thinking that he was going to rescue Jesus. Um, how prideful he is that he could do what Jesus said he was not going to do. And you think he would have learned his lesson, um, but, but he didn't. And it, you have to think that he never forgot that look. You have to think about that. I mean, there probably are things in each one of our lives that either you're, you're happy about or you're embarrassed about, and you still can remember what it was like, what happened, what the situation was, how that person looked at you. And uh, it's especially if it's a failure that you had, um, and I've had some, you know, and I, I look back and I try not to dwell on it too much, but man, you can pull those up any time. Um, and uh, Peter carried that with him till probably the day he died. Um, and it says he went out from there and wept bitterly. Um, and in the accounts, it says that not only did he weep bitterly, twice, in two of the accounts, it says that he remembered what Jesus had said. So it's not just that he realized that he denied. He, Jesus had looked at him and he remembered what Jesus had told him and surely remembered all the things he said he wouldn't. And yet what Jesus said came true. And uh, he's remembering all this stuff in just um, quite a bitter, a bitter time of weeping for him. Um, probably never forget that either. So I think that, go ahead. That's just such a picture of God's grace for us today. Mm -hmm. Anything we do, I mean, anything, God has forgiven us for grace. Yes, definitely. In, in, one of the, uh, in one of the commentaries that I was reading, uh, it's a really interesting story that they shared, that during, during the time that uh, the Soviet Union was around and they persecuted Christians, um, especially in the Eastern, Eastern Europe, the persecution was very intense and many times there would be these moments where they had to make a decision do I either accept or admit that I am a Christian knowing that I'll lose everything or do I deny him and uh, keep everything but still remain a Christian right and uh, and we hear all the stories of the people who were brave and went to their death but there are just as many stories of people who denied who are Christian who are my brothers and sisters and denied and so uh, many times when they did that, um, some of the churches would kick them out of the church. Like, well, if you deny Christ, you don't belong to Christ, is how they interpreted it. So other churches would say, you made a mistake, um, do better next time. And there are stories of where they did. And there's stories of people that denied again. Um, now, I can't see people's hearts, but there's a, when, when Soviet Union fell and the churches were more open, Many of these people who had denied Christ, and they knew who they were, because these were situations that the church knew who they were, and some of them were very public, some of them were broadcast on television or radio, um, or very public in front of the church. So people knew who these people were that denied Christ. So then they wanted to be restored back into the church. And there was quite a split of churches, because some churches said, no, you denied Christ, that's it. You don't belong to Christ anymore, and you can't. Other churches that said, well, that's a mistake. Look at Peter tonight. They went to this passage and say, Peter denied Christ and Christ restored him. So, um, and, and the other churches said, no, said, well, okay. They finally relented and said, well, we'll let you come back in, but you have to make a public profession and confession. You have to publicly stand up and confess and then profess Christ. And some people did. Um, other people wouldn't. And so they go to other churches and those churches would accept them. And, and so there was a split between these two kinds of kinds of churches, these restorationist churches, in essence is what they call them, or non-restorationist churches. So there's a big kerfluffle about this. And uh, But this was a passage they would go back to. In this whole situation, they spent a lot of time studying it. The elders of the church and the, uh, the leaders or the bishops of the church, they, they were studying this, trying to figure out what they should actually do. Um, and um, the interesting question. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer, but, uh, but 
I do point out that Jesus prayed for Peter um, and he restored Peter, uh, which we'll, we'll look at here in a second when Jesus restored Peter. But um, what, what are the lessons, lessons that we can learn from this? Um, and really these are lessons that I've learned. One is that Peter's pride kept him from hearing the warning Jesus gave at the supper and the garden. He was so convinced that he was who he thought he was, not what Jesus said he was, but he had such an image of himself and what he could do and was so proud of that, that he didn't listen to what Jesus said. He didn't take it to heart. And then when Jesus warned him, says you need to watch and pray. Um, in fact, in the garden, uh, Jesus was, I think, was inviting. He was concerned. Remember when we were in the garden and I said, I don't know that Jesus was frustrated. They weren't staying awake for his sake. I think in his suffering, he was taking time out to come back there to strengthen them and encourage them for their sake. Uh, I believe those three visits he made back to them was challenging them. And when you look at what he says and how he says it when he comes back, I think what he's doing is saying, hey, guys, you really need to be watching and praying because I know that you think that you're okay but you're not okay, you need to pray. Um, you need to pray for, for strength to avoid temptation because your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Therefore, you need to pray. Um, anyway, so the other thing, the lesson that I got here, and this is kind of what you said, Vicki, uh, the same eyes which saw Peter after his failure sees us and ours. Really nothing, it's the same eyes, and we don't see the eyes, we don't see Jesus looking at us, but he sees us, right? Um, and... I bet each one of us would have a point in life where we had an opportunity to share and we know we should have shared and we know that afterwards and we feel really bad that we didn't. We didn't admit. We weren't in a bad of a situation as Peter, yet we didn't do what we look at Peter and say he didn't do, right? Um, and those same eyes, you know, look at us. Now, Peter, of course, came through this and was restored. Um, take a look at 1 Peter 1. Um, I was thinking about this as... Uh, because you would think that if this was the greatest failure, that Peter would say something, right? P Peter would, and I think this gets to the, the answer to the question, what was difference between, be different between the two? And in verse six, um, six through eight, and this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various tri trials. And, and I, I can't help, when we were studying through First Peter, I, I can't help but think that Peter had his greatest failure in mind when he was writing this. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, like I saw him, but though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And I should have said, oh, I, no, for, through verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So... I think the answer, this is my answer for what's, what's different. I think what's different between Judas and Peter was his faith. Because when Jesus, sorry, when Jesus talked to Judas, he didn't say, Judas, you have faith and I'm praying for your faith. Judas didn't have faith. So when Jesus said that Judas was going to betray, he said, it'd be better that you not even be born. In other words, you're not a believer. You followed me for three years and now you're going to betray me. It'd be better that you not even be born. But to Peter, who had been with him for three years, he had faith, and Jesus interceded for him and said, Satan is asked to do this, but I'm going to pray that your faith may come through it. Um, and, and, and if you remember what he said, he wants to sift you. And very similar, I think, to what happened to Job, where Satan came before God and said, uh, and God said, have you seen my, my servant Job? Have you seen his faith? Bragging about Job's faith. And Satan said, well, it's not for nothing. And God said, well, you can sift him in essence. You can, you can do all these things to him, but his faith isn't going to fail. Well, why didn't his faith fail? Well, because his faith is, a, I believe faith is a gift from God. It's God's faith and God's faith doesn't fail. Uh, true faith won't ultimately fail. It does make mistakes. I mean, ultimately, not, not here and there. Um, it does make mistakes, but ultimately it won't fail because it's God's faith. And God and, and Jesus prays that our faith is strengthened, that it, it continues and Jesus is restored. So, I think the difference is the faith of Peter. Um, and Jesus also was interceding for Peter where he wasn't for Judas because Judas was not a believer. There was not the faith, the saving faith. And when, and when Peter talks about this faith, he says the ultimate result of the faith, the genuine faith, the kind that's tested even through fire, um, is going to result in salvation of our souls. And so that's the kind of faith 
that, uh, that Peter had. Now, in the old ways of talking about this, and you might have heard this, the perseverance of the saints, that means the faith won't fail ultimately, or once save, always save is another way to say that. Um, that they will make mistakes, they may fall, and their fall may be massive, like Peter did here in the denial, but ultimately God will sustain your faith. And you, when, when a person of true faith falls, where they turn is important. You notice that when Judas failed, he turned to try to rectify it himself. He threw the money back and he was sorrowful and he killed himself, right? Because he couldn't, I, I, don't, I can't get in his head and it doesn't say, but, uh, but when Peter failed, he wept bitterly, but yet he was there in the upper room with the disciples. He didn't run away. He didn't kill himself, right? And then Jesus restored him on that shore, um, which we, we'll look at here in a second in, in John. So I would say, our faith may be tested in failure, or you might say tested through our failure, um, but true faith will be refined through it, as Peter says in 1 Peter um, 1, 6 through 9. Um, those with true faith repent. And I know repent and turn is kind of the same thing, but repent and turn to Christ. They repent to Christ might be a way to say it. Um, you go to him and you cry out and say, I've sinned, I repent, please help me, right, is what we do. Uh, but those who are not a believer, when difficult times come, like one of the three, one of the three bad soils, is they fall away. Uh, things get choked out, and it's too difficult, so they walk away. Um, so Peter is restored in John twenty-one. Um, let me just turn to that. In John twenty-one, uh, verses fifteen through seventeen. Um, and I don't think it's out of coincidence that John, I think, was close enough to hear, hear this. Because remember, later on, Jesus says, you're going to go and you're going to go where you don't want to go. And somebody's going to raise your arms and others describing the death he was going to die. And remember, he says, what about him? So you get this idea that John may have been following closely, but John was there. Um, a lot of people don't talk about this, but who let Peter into the courtyard? Well, John. John was there in the courtyard. He was there to see Peter's failure. And you know that somebody who spent three years together, that close, that you know John saw what was going on. He might have even been around the fire. Um, and John didn't really say anything. He saw this. And he also, I think, that's why I say it's not well a coincidence that he also heard the restoration of Jesus, of Peter. And I also found it fascinating that Peter does not include this in Mark. John does. I think that's kind of sweet. I think there was some competition between the two, just fun, you know, two guys competition. I think there was like brotherly, uh, best friend kind of competition. You can see it throughout the, uh, throughout the scriptures. But here, I think it's sweet that John is the one who records the restoration. He says, and when they had finished breakfast, uh, by the way, you know how Jesus made breakfast that day? Breakfast, <laughs> I think, because he didn't fish. He had the, had the fish there before the disciples were there, so I think it's probably the best breakfast they've ever had. Um, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, um, again, when it, it seems like whenever Jesus uses his old name, it, and he does, it, it does this in the Old Testament too, whenever Jacob did something bad or the angels talking, it's Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. When he ever does something good, it's Israel, Israel, Israel. Here, it seems like, and you can see this, that when, G, when Jesus is, talking to Peter, he might have done something that's not good. He's like, Simon, Simon. Uh, but then when he's challenging where he said something good, he's like, Peter, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved uh, because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And that's, that's the restoration, 15 through 17. Um, won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's actually, as I understand, um, English word for love is really flat because I love my wife and I love pizza and hopefully I love them differently and in different ways than, um, you know, that, that I love my wife differently than I love pizza, right? But in, yes, one would hope. Um, but in, in Greek, there's multiple words, as we know, and in the first two, he uses phileo, which is, um, which is brotherly love. And the last one, he uses agape, as I understand. I think that's reversed, 
Oh, it's reversed. It's agape, agape. Oh, that's, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's agape, agape. And then he says, well, do you, it says, do you even love me as a brother? That's why it says he's grieved. <laughs> of course I agape you. So he's saying, do you agape me? Yes, I agape you. Do you agape me? Yes, I agape you. Do you even, do you phileo me? <laughs> that's a lower level. And so this is why he was grieved. But Peter was restored. So um, in closing, what is the application? And uh, first, when I started studying this, of Peter's denial, um, you know, sometimes when uh, the story is a narrative, you look at the narrative and you don't always see a direct application. This is not an epistle, right? He's not giving direct instruction on how we should live our lives. But these stories are here for a reason. And so I like to ask, well, why? Why did the Holy Spirit put this here? Why do we have these details? Why is there information for us? And um, I think there is a, a very important application for us. Because um, how many of us have, have never failed? Or how many of us have failed and we feel bitter for our failure? And I would bet that there's probably one or two things, maybe even more in our lives, that we still have a hard time forgiving ourselves for what we've done, right? That it's just you look back on that and it's always brought to your mind. Um, so what do we do to prepare for those times. As I mentioned, I think Satan has a tendency to work quickly and surprisingly, and unless we've prepared or unless we've, we've prayed and watched, so to speak, um, we get caught. And then afterwards we go, oh, I know I should have prepared for this or I should have been ready for this. So I think the instruction that Jesus gave to Peter in the garden applies to us as well. Uh, he says, watch and pray. And remember when we looked at the watch, it just means stay awake. Don't fall asleep, right? In other words, don't let Satan catch you unawares. Don't let the world catch you unawares. Don't be tripped up. Watch where you're walking. See where you're going. Be alert. Um, uh, don't sleep. And then the pray, the pray for help. Um, I like this little saying that says, by ourselves we can't, um, but with Christ we can. And so therefore, if that's true, which I believe it is, what should we be doing? And that's praying for help. Uh, there's a famous prayer, and when I first heard it, I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. But the, as more I've studied scripture, the more I think the prayer is biblical. It uh, was by Augustine. And he said, God, command what you will and grant what you command. So the, the idea is God many times asks us to do things that's impossible for us to do. Only through the Holy Spirit and his word can we do it. For example, can you tell somebody to like something? Like if you don't like a food, because somebody just say, okay, you need to start, learn to like it. How do you, I mean, the taste is taste, right? Emotions too. God says that we should love. God says we should rejoice. God says we should be thankful. Now those are, those are emotions. How do you tell somebody to be thankful for something, right? And I believe those kinds of things and many other things require the input of the Holy Spirit in our life. And that's where this prayer comes from. God command what you will and grant what you command. In other words, Tell me what you want me to do, I will obey, but I know I can't do it, so please empower me to obey, is kind of what he's asking. And I think it's the same thing here for Peter. And I, I think he, he believed that his spirit was strong enough, or his spirit is willing, that he could just will himself through this. And we hear this in some Christian teaching of just need to pull yourself by the bootstraps, you need to discipline yourself to do these things, you need to be prepared and have all the answers and ready to go. And really all that's doing is building up your spirit is willing piece. There's a missing piece there, which is I need the Holy Spirit in my life. And that's where the prayer comes. So it's not just God's word in my heart. It's, it's, it's God in my heart. It's the Holy Spirit empowering me. It's, it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of David, right? Or the fruit of Kathy, or the fruit of Vicki, or the fruit of Jean. It's, it's the fruit of the Spirit working out through me. Um, and we see that all throughout the epistles. So watch and pray. So stay alert and pray for strength for things that we don't even know is coming around the corner. Um, or it may be that you've fallen in certain areas and that is what we should be praying about is God empower me and be prepared, help me keep awake. And those are things we ask for. Um, and here on the disciples prayer in Matthew um, 6, um, 9 through 13. Um, some people call it the Lord's prayer. I understand why they call it that because the Lord gave it to the disciples. But remember the disciples, I think it's in Luke said, Lord teach us to pray. And God gives them this prayer. So I like to call this the disciples' prayer um, in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And I think this prayer is such a good... Um, uh, some people believe you could just say it, wrote, and um, uh, being a, being a um, 
growing up in Michigan outside of Notre Dame, every time before they come out and play football, they say the Lord's Prayer. Really? So all these, all these big, massive human beings you know, ready to come out and, and knock people off the ball and play, play football, they're, they're saying the Lord's Prayer. And they broadcast it in the stadium. So the, the <laughs> prayer is broadcast in the stadium before they come out, before they do all the introductions and stuff. And um, some people do that, and they think that that's, that's what it means. Pray this prayer, therefore I'm going to say these words. But if you study this prayer, you see that what this person, is, what Jesus is telling us to do is, is um, the, I'll just say it this way, the structure is something that we can use for our prayer. So it says, Our Father in heaven, um, hallowed be your name, or holy, may your name become holy. Um, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's will is done in heaven all the time. I'm praying that his will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Um, now we know it is, but still we're still praying for it. And that's the beauty of prayer is you may know that God's gonna do something, but still that we should be praying. The pattern of Daniel, who knew exactly 70 years, we're gonna be set free, but I'm gonna pray still. I'm gonna repent for what we've done and pray that God will do, which I know he's already going to do. Um, that Anyway, so give us this day our daily bread. The phrase daily bread in the Jewish uh, culture meant everything that I need is provision. It's not just... And we kind of say that, right, that so-and-so brings home the bread or makes the bread or brings home the bacon, whatever it is. Um, it's not just bread. It's everything, everything I need to be provided for. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from, um, in the uh, early manuscripts, I believe it says the evil one. Um, so when you look at this, you're looking to God. You're saying your will be done. This is mirroring what Jesus prayed. You know, hey, I want this to happen, but nevertheless, your will be done and I'm going to obey. And Jesus gave us a pattern for that part of the prayer. Your kingdom come. Um, but this last piece, lead us not into temptation or deliver us from evil. Um, I don't have time to, to expand that because our time is up. But, but I believe the Cliff Notes version of that is that we're asking God to um, sustain us through temptation sustain us. I know temptation will come. I know testings will come. I know sufferings will come. Sustain me through it. Um, and I believe if, if this lesson here that he gave multiple times from what we can tell to the disciples, maybe even more than that, was being applied in the garden when he says, watch and pray. How about you pray the prayer that you said, teach us to pray. Here's this prayer. If, if Peter had understood this and been praying this prayer, things might have been different. Um, and you can't help but think that Peter remembered that. Um, you know, that I should have been doing this. Um, and I think you can read through 1 Peter and see some of this throw, uh, flow through his teaching and 1 Peter through his, his great uh, failure. And the fact that this shows up in Mark tells us that Peter probably preached on this. He preached his great failure in front of other people and Mark captured it and it came into the, uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, and I think it's for our benefit that it's there. And I think if you look at how Peter failed, you look at how Jesus restored him. To come back to the question, um, what's different between Judas and Peter? I think the answer is Peter had faith. And Jesus knew he had faith and was praying for his faith. So not only did he have faith, the second, there's actually two things. One, he had faith. The second is the great intercessor was praying for him. And surely God listens to his son when he asks. And, and I believe that you can apply that to yourself as well because he ever lives to make intercession for us. You want to know how Jesus prays for us? Look at how he prayed for Peter when he knew the failure was coming. He says, I pray that your faith will be sustained. So yes, you will be sifted. Yes, I've given permission for Satan to do this. Yes, I know you'll fail. But I'm praying that your faith is sustained. But it's not just that it's sustained for your benefit. That's, another, that's the last thing I would, I would say is it's not just for Peter's benefit that he prayed for the faith to be sustained. Remember what he said? He says, so that you can strengthen your brothers. In other words, after you failed, I'm praying that your faith will be sustained so that you can strengthen your brothers and look at how you restored them. He said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. So yeah, you may fail, but what if that failure can bring God glory? And what if that failure can help you strengthen others who are going through the same thing? Um, and I think it can. I think that's a biblical thing. So any comments on that before we I just, pray? I'm thinking of the day of Pentecost and Peter's sermon, just so powerful in chapter 2 and 3, and that, you know, with boldness, he was able to, you know, through that restoration, speak with boldness. Right, he had, what, about 50 days? 
from the time that he was restored, maybe less, 50 days between that restoration. Yeah, and until the time he gave that, that sermon. It's just amazing to see the difference of the Holy Spirit working in somebody's life of what Peter was like in the Gospels, what Peter's like in Acts. It's just a phenomenal uh, testimony to what the Spirit can do. And like you said, application. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. We thank you for this picture that you led Peter to share with us. We pray that, um, like Peter, we can, um, even through failure, turn to you, repent unto you, and, and know that you are praying for us, strengthen us. We pray that we would take the lessons from Peter and learn from his mistakes. We would watch and we would pray. We would, see, we would uh, run after you, fill our minds with you, pursue you, so when these things come up that they don't trip us. And when they do, that we, we repent and we turn back to you. We thank you that yours is a throne of grace that yours is a throne that we can come to and ask for mercy and grace when we're in time of need like Peter was. We thank thank you for these things. We praise your son for these things. And we pray for Pastor Joe in the next uh, service with all the hodgepodge of things going on that you would direct it and you would gain glory. Pray this in your son's name, amen.